Welcome back. Price of Creation by Lance Conrad, Chapter 3. There are few things more powerful than a name. A single phrase that somehow becomes a symbol for an entire existence. What can it mean that mine is gone? Musings of the Historian. A young boy had obviously been sent running to get Arik, because he met us halfway, breathless. Boy! The lad managed to yell out breathlessly as Arik drew near. It's a boy! Arik was to him in seconds, grabbing the youth by the shoulders and lifting him off the ground to eye level. And Luria, is she all right? Arik asked frantically. The boy nodded. She's fine. She's with the midwife now. Arik dropped the boy unceremoniously on the ground and ran on through the town. I glanced back at the boy who had been dropped. He didn't look at all surprised by Arik's conduct. He mostly seemed glad to be able to rest and rub his shoulders where Arik had gripped them. We ran into a group of people who were gathered around a building that I guess was the midwife's house. Several people slapped Arik on the back and repeated the news that the breathless lad had already delivered. A son had been born and Luria was doing fine. Arik, after catching his breath, asked, What color of stone was he born with? Some of the people started to look confused, as if they hadn't thought of that before. One woman spoke up. That's odd, Arik. The midwife didn't say. She only yelled that it was a boy. Murmurs spread through the crowd. I gathered that the color of a child's stone was usually announced with the birth. Arik's joy couldn't be dimmed, however. He just shrugged his shoulders and laughed. That would be my son, all right. Even distracted the midwife, cute little devil. Everyone laughed at Arik's light-headed wit. A stern-looking woman poked her head out of the window and ordered Arik into the house. He quickly complied. I was shocked to see Arik emerge a few minutes later with the baby in his arms and Luria looking exhausted but still smiling by his side, leaning heavily on his broad arm. I had seen a great many births, and it was usually a long time, sometimes even days, before the woman was allowed to walk about or the baby was strong enough to be taken home. In this case, both mother and child seemed healthy, though completely exhausted. I wondered if it had anything to do with the stones that the people wore. Maybe there was one that helped the midwife to speed recovery, or perhaps these women were naturally very hardy. I wasn't excluding any possibilities until I learned more. Arik pushed his way through the cheering crowd. Some in the crowd asked what color the baby's stone was, but Arik seemed not to hear them, entirely engrossed in his new child. The crowd slowly dissipated, respecting the couple's privacy and the sacred moment of taking the child home. I followed at a distance. Only one man followed closely, Sadhan. He wore a look of deep suspicion and seemed intent on satisfying his curiosity at any, at any cost. I was shocked at his audacity as he entered the house after them and closed the door behind him. I waited outside the door and listened to the voices within. What color is baby stone, Arik? What are you trying to hide? Sadon's tone was accusing. One moment, you old woman. Let me put my wife to bed first and I'll listen to your cackling. Arik's voice, which had been so gleeful only minutes before on the street, had developed a bitter edge. There was a long silence. As Adon waited in the living room and I waited outside the door for Ark to pull the rear to bed with the baby. His heavy footsteps again sounded on the floor and Sadon's high-pitched voice again demanded. Well? You want to see my baby's son, Sadon, and you will. But know that it means nothing. I heard a gasp from within. I knew that something was wrong. It only took a couple of seconds before Sadon's screeches broke the awkward silence. It is one of the destroyers! No light passes through the stone! His loud ravings reached the entire village, and people were already starting to filter back on the street to see what was going on. The child must be killed, Auric. You know the law. We can't have that, that thing living among us. Hey, now, you just stay back. Why are you protecting it anyway? Think of what this child means. Sadon's voice lowered slightly. I had to lean close to the door to hear. Maybe your precious little Larry hasn't been quite so faithful as you thought. I stepped quickly to the side, away from the door. My hunch paid off as I almost thrown through the door. The wood splintering as his weight crashed through it. He landed hard and rolled in the dust. Aura came through the door after him, looking like a titan, ready to pull the heavens down on top of the quivering man. 
His face was red and the veins in his arms bulged as he pointed at Han and bellowed in a voice that reverberated through the watching crowd. If you ever speak on a word like that or up your head from your shoulder, Han, I will not allow your bitterness to taint my home. The boy's my son will be raised as such. Arik raised his eyes to the crowd, who stood with jaws gaping wide in surprise. This is my child's stone, he yelled, and lifted his hand high to show the people its contents. The stone, unlike the clear stones of the villagers, was opaque. Beyond that it was of no color at all, but of the deepest black. It almost seemed to draw light from around it, making its surroundings seem darker. The people drew back in fear, as if they expected the stone itself to attack them. In a single instant, the observant crowd of about thirty people had become a mob, a creature of impulse and rage. It is stone to destroy her! It's evil! The child should be destroyed! The law must be obeyed! The shouts from the mob turned from confusion to anger in a moment. These were frightened people, and frightened people are dangerous. Sadhan had crawled to the back of the crowd, gasping and holding his arms, when his voice added to the angry din. Arik stood his ground and roared back at them like a lion defending his cub. He will not be killed! The crowd didn't lose a second in answering. It's the law! Then it will be disobeyed! came the thundering response. The mob would not be dissuaded, however. Then what will you do with him? He will stay with us. No, he can't. The tone of the crowd had turned desperate and dangerous. Why not? Ari questioned. But his voice had already taken on the tone of one who knew that words weren't going to do any good. Standing to the side, I could see his fist clench, the thick cords and muscle in his arm tightening. His words only meant to delay what was surely coming. Out of the crowd stepped an older man, this one with a far calmer look on his face. His graying hair and sad eyes spoke of wisdom. A red stone hung about his neck. Judging by the way he held himself and how the people deferred to him, I guessed that this was a leader among this people. Speaking softly, his voice cut through the yelling. Arik, we understand that you don't want to get rid of your child. Any of us would feel the same. You must remember that these things have happened before. We must not shrink away from our responsibility. Besides, how will your son fit in among us? What will he do without a craft? Maybe it would be better if we turn him over to the destroyers when he is old enough to be away from his mother. Arik started to object, but was beaten to it by the wild objections of the villagers. To what end, Boren? You will only grow to come back over here and kill us and steal our food. Boren, the older man, tried to quiet the crowd, but with little success. Arik, in the meantime, had become very thoughtful. Suddenly his head rose. He will fight for us, he yelled decisively. The crowd quieted, awaiting further explanation. We all know that one destroyer is worth five of our best men in a fight, and we have all lost loved ones to their raids. I will raise my boy to be a fighter. He will stand against them and protect us. He will be a warrior. That will be his craft. The mob shifted mulling amongst themselves. The idea had merit. Their cowardice and the appeal of having someone else fight their battles for them was being weighed against their hatred and suspicion. Arik moved to tip the scales. He eased open the door and ducked inside it for just a moment before reappearing with one of his blacksmith hammers held in his meaty fist. The hammer bore the scars of thousands of strokes. The head was large and heavy, but Arik held it lightly, as if it weighed no more than a stick. That is what will happen. I will say no more. If any of you persist in wanting to harm my family, I will consider you worse than the destroyers, and I will be waiting inside for you. I bid you all a good day. Arik raised the hammer in a parting salute, turned and started to walk back into the house. Almost as an afterthought, he turned and said, His name will be Sadavir. With that, he turned and walked back inside. I would have said that the door wouldn't close with its damaged hinges, having nearly been knocked into the street by Sadhan's thrown body, but a strong pull by Arik's arm shifted the door into its place. A momentary silence fell on the street. Let's get him! He can't fight all of us! The high-pitched scream was unmistakable. Sadhan's demand, however, only served to solidify the reality of Arik's threat in the minds of the mob. They shifted slightly, 
then scattered like dry leaves tossed by an autumn wind. With the mob dissolved, Sadan skulked away, limping and holding his arm. The cowardice that Arik had mocked the night before had at last served a useful purpose.